listening to Psalm uh, Psalm 116 tonight. Psalm 116. Lord, we're excited to be in this psalm this evening. There's such wonderful significance here, such wonderful history here. And I pray, Lord, that it would become one of our favorite psalms, Lord, as we spend this time this evening. Speak to us, Lord, and bless us feed us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the book of Matthew, chapter 26, right at the end there, uh, particularly we're going to look at verse 30, it talks about the, the communion dinner, and Jesus takes his disciples into the upper room, and there he serves the communion. You've heard it many times before. But we get to verse 30, and it says, that after they were finished with the communion dinner, they sang a a psalm together, a hymn. And then they left to go out there uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus would be arrested. So it's been speculated as to exactly what psalm or what hymn did they sing. Now, as we've studied, beginning back in Psalm 113, this group from 113 to Psalm 118 is called the Hallel Psalms, if you remember. Hallel means praise. Now, they're significant because at a Passover meal, they would include the singing of these Hallel hymns, Psalm 113 to 118. Now, according to tradition... Participants would sing Psalm 113 and 114 at the beginning of the dinner, the beginning of the meal. And then when the meal was all over, then they would sing Psalm 115 to 118. And so if the Lord is going to stay with tradition of what the Jews would do, then here at this meal, they probably would have sung Psalms 113 and 114 before the dinner began. They would have had communion, and then at the end when they sang, it says a hymn, so we don't know if they picked just one of these songs out or if they sung collectively the songs 115 to 118. But I think what I want you to focus on is that you will see some parallels here of speaking this particular psalm of our Savior after he rose from the dead. So it, to me, it just is such significance, such history you know, to read this specific psalm. So Psalm 116 uh, focuses on our thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving to God for delivering the psalmist here from a deadly sickness of some kind. Now because of that, many of the Jew commentators believe that this psalm was written by Hezekiah. Now, the story of Hezekiah is in 2 Kings chapter 20. And there we see that Isaiah told King Hezekiah to get his house in order because he's going to die. Now, of course, that didn't sit very well with Hezekiah. Nobody wants to have someone tell them that you're going to die. I've been with people who have had this told to them that they are in stage four of cancer or something, and they've got weeks to live. And that's a very traumatic thing uh, to hear somebody tell you. He didn't want to die. And so he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard his cry and allowed him 15 more years of his life. So Hezekiah did recover from his illness. But those 15 years that God added to his life, they weren't good years. It wasn't God's perfect will for Hezekiah to live those additional years. So keep that in mind. This may have been written by Hezekiah as God delivered him from a deadly disease and added these 15 more years to his life. Something else to think about as we look at this parallel. This very song could have been sung by Jesus with his disciples on that night of his betrayal and arrest. So keep those thoughts in your mind. Here we go. Verse 1. I love the Lord. 
because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. I want you to notice how this begins here. For those of you who think that I don't pray because I don't have those words that other people have. I I don't have the sophisticated words. My words are simple, and, and so I don't feel very good about praying or praying publicly. Look at his prayer. begins with simply, I want to let you guys know, I love the Lord. That's a prayer right there. That's worship of the Lord. So to those of you who think you've got to come up with some lengthy, formal prayer, you can see that's not the case. The psalmist here just cries out, I love the Lord. So it should be a true encouragement to know the simplest words for love for the Lord is genuine worship. That's what God wants to hear. When your little kids come up to you and you want to have a conversation with them and they look in your eye and say, Mom or Dad, Mommy, Daddy, I love you. What else could they say? What else could they say that's going to bless your heart any more than that? And of course, God wants to hear that from us too. The simplest of prayers. So the psalmist here is excited that when he cried out to the Lord, the Lord heard him. He actually answered his prayer. And what a real amazing thought we have here. When we want an audience with the Lord, we don't have to make an appointment. We don't have to wait till he's free. We don't have to go stand in line somewhere until you don't have to pull a number and wait for them to call your number. You can go to the Lord at any time, day or night, and the Lord will hear your cry. He'll hear your prayer. So many people don't appreciate it when the Lord hears their request. They think, uh, seem to think that it's something that the Lord owes us. God doesn't owe you anything. What you deserve is hell. And so for the Lord to allow you uh, an audience with him is just mind-blowing in the first place. But to have an audience with him without hesitation, without waiting, but the moment you call upon his name, he hears what you have to say. We were having lunch the other day at a restaurant, and this little boy, no, it was actually at uh, the, the AT&T store, and this little boy, the mother was trying to buy a phone, and this little boy kept going, mommy, 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 and I started dancing to it, kind of, mommy, 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 mommy. you know, he's got a good beat going here. He would not stop until she addressed him. And then moments later, he wanted her attention again. Mommy, mommy. It started all over again. This went on for about an hour until we got our phone. I got out of there. My head was about ready to explode. You don't have to do that with God. God hears you. He hears your cries. But understand, God doesn't owe you anything. So the psalmist here is grateful to God for keeping communication open with him. Are you grateful for that? We should be. He says, I will call upon him as long as I live. So the singer here is making a vow to never call upon any other deity. He was going to call upon the Lord. His allegiance, his love would always be only to the one who inclined his ear and came and helped him. Why was this man so dedicated to the Lord in this song? Well, I think the next verse gives us a hint. Look at verse 3. The pains of death surrounded me, and the pains of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble, and I found sorrow. So here's why this man is calling out to the Lord. It's because he is so sick, he thinks he's actually going to die. So this is nearly identical to what David wrote in Psalm 18, verse 4 and 5, that we studied a long time back now. David said, the pains of death surround me. The floods of ungodliness make me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surround me. The snares of death confronted me. Now in the New Testament, the word Sheol is a reference to the grave. It was a place where the saved and the unsaved both would go when they died. There are two parts to Sheol, according to the New Testament. The first was known as the bosom of Abraham. It was a paradise where the saints of the Old Testament and all those before Christ died and rose again from the dead, it's where all those saints would go. 
It was into the bosom of Abraham, a place of comfort, a place of rest. So when Jesus died, we're told that he spent three days in the belly of the earth. And in that time, Jesus went to Abraham's bosom and he took those who were in there with him up to heaven, where they now await to come with Jesus when he returns to this earth for his thousand-year reigns. So they're there in heaven now with the Lord. But the Lord had to lead them into heaven. Now the second part is known as a place of darkness and suffering. This is where the unbeliever goes when they die and they await then for the great white throne judgment where they'll be judged for every sin they've ever committed and they'll be judged and spend eternity there after in hell with Satan and his demons forever because they rejected Jesus Christ and the free gift of eternal life that he offered to them. So this place continues to be filled even today, a place of torment. People think, when I was younger, that they're going to die and there's going to be a big party in, he in hell. There's going to be a kager down there and we're all going to be partying. What a foolish thought. If you read the Bible, it tells us this place is going to be in utter darkness. Have you ever been in utter darkness before? When my kids were little, we took them out to some caves out near the river. I can't remember the name of them right now. But we went out to these caves, and you would go into one part of the cave, and there would be a, a ranger there, and they had a light. And he would turn the light off, and there was absolute, utter darkness. And I'll tell you, it freaks you out. It'd be in complete darkness where your eyes will not adjust. It's complete darkness. You imagine being in a place forever in complete darkness. You're not going to feel anybody handing you a cold beer. It's going to be a place of torment, a place of loneliness where it'll be the absence of the Lord himself. So, verse 4, Then I called upon the name of the Lord, O oh Lord, he said, I implore you, deliver my soul. And I love what he says in verse 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. All these, these, uh, these verbs here, gracious, and so descriptive here. God is gracious, isn't he? Somebody? Oh, okay, I thought maybe I lost you there for a minute. The Lord is not just gracious, but he is righteous. He is full of mercy. He says the Lord preserves the, uh, preserves the simple. He says, I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul. You know when you're sick, your soul's not at rest. It's just there's a disturbance in the force, you know what I mean? It's not at rest. And when you begin to finally feel healing and you feel normal again, your soul can rest. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. So it isn't uncommon to get very anxious when you're sick. And here the singer is very sick. He believes he's going to die. And so he has become anxious and he cries out to the Lord, it sounds almost, it has the feeling to it of almost a state of panic. And again, if you've ever been close to death, you know what that feeling is. No one can help you. No medication can ease that pain. When I had pancreatitis, there's nothing they could do, really. They put me on an IV drip, and I wasn't allowed to have a drink of water. You imagine not being able to eat or drink for five days? And I had a roommate who's sitting there going, can I have some more ice cream? And he would be served this food, and he goes, this stuff's junk. And I was over there salivating. Have you ever thought hospital food sounds like prime rib? Well, it did to me. You go a few days without eating. I couldn't even have an ice chip. And it was a very lonely place, especially when the doctor comes in and says, Mr. Morris, it's 50-50. You may not make it. I need to tell you the truth. That's a scary place to be, that you're that close to possibly going home and being, in, being done. Was I really ready? Did I have my house in order? All these thoughts began to enter into my mind. Am I really ready to go? You better be ready. You better be prepared. 
So one great lesson that everyone needs to learn here, prayer goes very well with peace. Amen? Amen. When you begin to pray and you give things to the Lord, it feels, oh, so wonderful. When you sense and feel the presence of the Lord and you sense and feel that he's got this, you give it to him and he'll take it. He'll never refuse your prayer. No, I don't want that. I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving my life. I'm putting all my worries and cares in your hands. No, I don't want them. That's, the Lord would never do that. But he says, cast all your cares upon him. And that's what we need to be doing. Here, that's what he did. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells us, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to the Lord. And there's a promise that comes with that when you do that. When you pray and you truly give it to the Lord, it goes on to say, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard over your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. And I've asked this question so many times. When you truly give things over to the Lord, he places a guard. Think about that. The word is garrison. It's the same word used for the guards that were placed over the tomb of Jesus there. It's being guarded. Your heart will be guarded by the Lord. And look at what it says. It'll guard over your what? Your heart and your mind. Why does it name body parts? Why doesn't it just say the peace of God will guard over you? Because what happens is the enemy comes in and begins to fill your mind with all these thoughts and it begins to break your heart. Amen? You've been there before. And so this is why this is so important for us to give these things truly to the Lord. So when we put all of our issues in the Lord's hands and we leave them there. Now our problem is we try to take it back from God. We say, here, take it. And he tries to take it, and you won't let go. So you get a struggle going back and forth with letting go of it. But when this man gave his anxious heart over to the Lord, the Lord responded to this man. And you see, with him, he healed him. So once he began to feel better, he calmed down also in his spirit. Verse 8, for you have delivered my soul from death. You've also delivered my eyes from tears and my feet from falling. Now, once again, I want you to picture for a moment that Jesus Christ saying this to the Father. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore, I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. So as God brings healing to the psalmist, it strengthens him. He's strengthened by it. And he's encouraged by it. And this is why we pray, for as God answers those prayers, it strengthens our faith. We give things to the Lord, he answers those prayers, it strengthens our faith. I hope you can see this picture here of the Lord. Christ's heart was full of gratitude to the Father for his threefold deliverance. His soul was delivered from death, and that Christ rose again in three days. His eyes were delivered from tears, and his feet were delivered from defeat. When he hung on that cross and died, Satan and all the demons in hell were throwing a big party. They thought they finally got to the Lord. They finally finished him off. But they had no idea what was coming. They had no idea that this was part of the plan that God had and that the Lord rose again. And that's when all of the keys for this earth were taken back away from Satan. Adam and Eve gave them to him, but the Lord bought them back with the blood that he shed on that cross. So Jesus walked before the Lord in the land of the living, a victor over sin, a victor over death, a victor over the grave, a victor over Sheol. The continuity of thought in verses 10 and 11, I have to admit, I, I went home last night and I struggled with it. I had to walk away from it. I came in this morning fresh and looked at it and I struggled with it again for some time. But verse 10 can be somewhat perplexing 
I believe, therefore I spoke. I'm greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. He's basically saying here, I kept on believing, even when I said I'm completely crushed, even when I was afraid. And he said, no one can be trusted. That's put in our own vernacular here. A full show of faith. The psalmist trust in God even while he was in the depths of great distress. So he was a shadowy pu- uh, per- uh, preview of the greatest demonstration of faith that would be shown by Jesus Christ among his disciples before going to the cross. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, Paul kind of took a line from this psalm and applied the whole principle to his own times of trusting God and speaking from the experience of that trust, even in trying times. Paul wrote, And since we have the same spirit of faith, 2 Corinthians 4.13, I'm sorry, According to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. So just like the psalmist, Paul is trusting that God's going to get him through this difficult time, even if it's possible that he would raise him from the dead. And so that's our hope today. Even if I die, I know the Lord promised to raise me up again. What a wonderful promise that is. The psalmist then concludes in verse 12 through 14. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I'll take up the cup of salvation and I'll call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So the psalmist wants to show his thanks by giving back to the Lord something. That should be our desire. Do you want to give back to the Lord something for your thanks of what he's done in your life, that you're saved? Oh, where would you be tonight if you did not have Jesus Christ? Many of us wouldn't be alive. And those that would, we'd probably be spending our time in some dark bar somewhere, or at home, all alone, divorced, split up from families, friends, losing our jobs, What do you give to God who owns everything? What can you give God? So if we're not His, and if we have not received His Son, Jesus Christ, He'll never be pleased with anything we could give Him. What do you give God who owns everything? Before we can give anything to the Lord, first of all, we need to accept we first must drink from the cup of salvation, as this psalmist points out. We must become born again. The Lord doesn't want anything from you but your, your acceptance of what he's done for you. He wants you to receive that willingly. There's no forced thing. You're not drafted into God's army. You have to volunteer to come. And God wants our hearts to be cleansed and then he'll accept the praises that comes forth from pure hearts. The Bible tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. If you really think about that, that should cause us to want to praise him a whole lot more, shouldn't it? Throughout the day and through the evening and when you're ready to go to bed, you don't have to outwardly sing some song, but praises from your heart to the Lord, thanking Him, worshiping Him. God never gets tired. Do you as a parent, do you get tired of your child saying, I love you? Well, God doesn't get tired of you either. He loves it when you come and just love on Him, when you thank Him, when you worship Him. The Lord loves that. Now, it's interesting that these psalms were connected to the Passover celebration. There were four special cups of wine that would be involved in the Passover. I want you to pay attention to this. During the cedar, the Passover meal, there were four cups of wine that would be drunk. Now follow me here. The first cup was called the kiddush, or the cup of sanctification. Second, 
The cup is called Magid, and that's the cup of deliverance. The third cup is called the Burkat Hamazon and was drunk after the meal. It was known as the cup of redemption. And at Jesus' last supper, he took the third cup, the cup of redemption, and he said to his disciples, Luke 22, verse 20, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which was shed for you. In other words, your redemption is going to come through the work that Jesus Christ did for you. But first, there must be a sanctification. There must be a deliverance. When we accept Jesus Christ and we understand that and we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, then we have that cup of redemption of what the Lord has done for us. So redemption will no longer take place by bringing sacrifices to a priest who then kills an animal uh, to shed that blood for you, free you from your sins. Instead, Jesus explains that we come to him in a whole new way and he forgives us completely for our sins. Our cup that we hold at communion is to remind us that Jesus died for us, shed his blood for us. It was a cup of redemption. For you and I. Pretty cool, isn't it? And this all speaks of Jesus Christ, and the Jews still don't see it as they celebrate the the Seder meal. Now, the fourth cup, it was called the Hallel, or the cup of praise. This cup started out as a cup of sorrow, a cup of bitterness for Jesus. But Jesus, while in the Garden of Gethsemane, he spoke of a cup. And in complete surrender to the Father's will, he consented to drink that cup. Remember, he said, if there's any way that this cup can pass from me, let it pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He didn't want to drink that in his flesh. But he said, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus drank that bitter cup, and he turned it into a cup of praise. So today, as we think about this, And we accept what Jesus Christ has done. A new covenant we get to celebrate. A covenant in his blood, which was shed for each of us. So our response to the Lord for giving us his redemption is to praise him like the psalmist here. We should be praising him forever. May that be on your lips all the time. The psalmist then says in Psalm 16, verse 14, I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Ah, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So we see death as something tragic. I've done so many funerals where the weeping is just heartbreaking. And sometimes people, months later, years later, still can't get over the loss of that person. But listen to what it says here. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. So many people have real difficult getting past that mourning. Of course we mourn. I can't imagine my life without my wife or my children or my grandchildren or even friends, many of you. I can't imagine my life without you being in my life. But if that person was a believer in Jesus Christ, God God sees their death as precious. Why? Because now, as Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So what an incredible thing. When Stephen was martyred, it says that he saw the Lord and he was standing. And I get this image that when one of us dies, The Bible tells us Jesus sits at the right hand of God. But I get a picture of when we die, Jesus stands up to welcome us into his his kingdom. What a beautiful picture that is. My Lord stands to welcome me into heaven. And I'll be with him for eternity. What a beautiful picture. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, I'm going to read verse 1 through 8 here. He says, for we know if this earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house that's not even made with hands, and it's eternal. It's in the heavens. For in this 
because of that fact, he says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation from heaven. Oh, how we long to not get up in the morning without hearing snap, crackle, pop when I begin to walk. And I'll tell you, you young folks, expect it, because it will come upon you. Oh, how we long to get up in the morning and to not have to worry about going to a job and not have to worry about the ambulance and the hospital and to remember to pick up your medications for all kinds of ailments that you might have. Oh, could you imagine being able to eat without heartburn? You just begin to think about all these things and think that, that would be really cool. I think about how I can't imagine being able to eat fish. <laughs> That'd be cool. You don't want to see me do it now. Or you'll see more than you want to see. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. We're mere mortals today. But now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we're at home in this body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, though. I hope you are tonight. Are you confident? He says, we are confident, yes, even well pleased, rather to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. Oh, what awaits you in heaven. Something that's beyond anything you could ever imagine. So in these verses, Paul points out that for those of our lords, death is only passing from this tent and placed into a mansion or an eternal body where there'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more worried. For you parents of teenagers, your teenagers go out. I remember saying again, I've shared this with you before, oh, I can't wait for my kids to get old enough where I don't worry about them so much. My kids are in their 30s, and I still worry about them constantly. The decisions they make today could affect the rest of their life. You'll never stop worrying about your children and praying for them and, and being concerned for them and the decisions they make. Oh, to be in heaven, all of us, and never have to worry about that again. Never have to worry. Re Did I remember to lock the door? Did I lock my car? You don't have to worry about any of that ever again. When God created the heavens and earth, there was no death. Everything was good until sin, sin entered into this world through Adam and Eve. And now we see the effects of that sin with death and destruction all around us. But the Lord is coming back to restore this world to a place it was like when he created it. We long for that day, but until he returns, we see death all around us. <clears throat> I like what Spurgeon said about this. He said, though death is a curse and an enemy, it is still precious because it removes the remaining barriers between God and his saints, and it's the doorway to an eternity of perfect fellowship. Death to the saints is not a penalty. It's not destruction. It's not even a loss. That's the right way to think about it. Heaven is so much better than what we have even here. So verse 16, O Lord, the psalmist says, Truly, I'm your servant. I'm your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds, and I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. <clears throat> and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. So the singer here dedicates himself to God's service on the basis of having his bonds loosened, no longer captured by sin, no longer captured by 
going close to death here. But he's freed from that. Now we need to be careful with vows that we make to the Lord. Many times they end up putting us in bondage and something we once did out of love we're now doing out of constraint. Now if you make a vow to the Lord, you need to keep it. What is the vow that the psalmist has offered to the Lord? It's praise. And thus he began this psalm in praising the Lord and now he ends this psalm in praising the Lord. He ends with hallelujah, both as a declaration of personal praise and a call for God's people to join him. He's not just going to praise the Lord in his own home. He says, I'm going to come in the congregation and I'm going to praise you in front of the whole congregation. Don't hold back from praising the Lord. And I think this is a great way now to eat in the evening for those of us who have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. So I've asked tonight, (coughs) excuse me, I knew a cough was coming sometime. I've asked for the worship group to come back up here at the end and instead of just doing one song to finish out the service, I'm going to have him do a couple or maybe three. And I just want you to just really think about what the Lord has freed you from And that you too can join with the psalmist here. And let's just spend some time and praise the Lord. Amen? Praise the Lord. Okay, come on up with me.